Dear friends, welcome back to the afternoon session of the symposium. I hope you all have a refreshing lunch break. The next speaker that I would like to introduce is Dr. William Van Garden. Dr. Van Garden is a chartered psychologist lecturing and conducting research in psychology at the University of Derby in UK. Recognized as an international expert in the research and practice of Buddhist meditation, Dr. Van Garden sits on the editorial board for various academic journals, including the journal Mindfulness. He also has over 100 academic publications related to the scientific study of Buddhist meditation in journals such as the British Medical Journal, British Journal of Health Psychology, and Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry. The topic of his presentation today is the psychotherapeutic applications of Buddhist emptiness principles. So without further ado, please join me to give a big hand to welcome Dr. Van Gordon to the stage. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. So, before I talk about the psychotherapeutic applications of Buddhist emptiness principles, I'd like to just put this aspect of research, of psychological research, into Buddhist techniques, into context. <clears throat> A few years ago, I wrote a paper with my colleague, Dr. Edo Shonin, and we posited that the Trishiksha, the three trainings principle, was a useful means of categorizing the different types of Buddhist techniques that we're currently seeing in psychotherapeutic, in clinical, in applied psychological settings. And the three components of the Buddhist Trishiksha principle are, of course, meditation, ethics, and wisdom. And it just so happens that that threefold categorization reflects the chronological order that research into Buddhist principles has followed. So, in the early 1980s, we saw the start in earnest of research exploring the meditation, the concentration, the mindfulness component. And then approximately 20 years later, there was a second phase that initiated, and that concerned primarily the ethical component of the path of meditation Practice. So we started to see research into compassion meditation, loving-kindness meditation, and other such approaches based on ethical principles. However, more recently, in approximately the last five years, a third phase of research has initiated exploring wisdom-based concepts such as non-self, such as emptiness, such as impermanence. So this is something that's happening now. This appears to be the direction that research is going in currently. And of course, research concerned with the first two phases is ongoing as well. So what is this emptiness construct that I'm going to talk about today? I suspect some of you have come across that term before, but I suspect some of you haven't. So let's just talk about it for a moment. Emptiness is everywhere. It's everything, yet it isn't anything. Individuals who think that they know what emptiness is, who think that they can, can conceptualize it, unfortunately they don't know what emptiness is. And Individuals who think that emptiness is not intrinsically related to mindfulness, unfortunately, don't know what mindfulness is. A, a, 
a Thai monk, a, a fairly renowned Thai monk who was embedded in both the Thai and the Zen Buddhist traditions, he stated the following about emptiness. People think it's not possible for lay practitioners to apply emptiness in their everyday life. They think emptiness is only for people who practice a higher dharma or a higher form of meditation in a forest or a cave. And he also stated, but emptiness can benefit everybody from every stratum of life. The essence of the path is emptiness, he stated. Myself and my colleague, Ed Oshonin, in a paper, however, have said that, in our opinion, emptiness is one of the most poorly understood contemplative teachings, and in some cases, attempts by scholars or teachers to impart an understanding of emptiness can create more confusion. And when we begin to work with lay people using emptiness, the next um, excerpt here that I'll share with you reflects a response, a reaction that we come across typically. One participant said in a study, emptiness is a very scary place to be. If I do not exist, then who am I? And what have I been doing all my life? I need to be certain and confident that I exist in order to move ahead. A very valid reaction, a very valid concern when first encountering a principle such as emptiness for the first time. So emptiness, this is important. Emptiness implies that phenomena don't exist independently or intrinsically, but it does not imply that phenomena do not exist. It implies that they exist in a manner that's perhaps different to how we may believe they exist. They exist in a relative sense. One way to try and tap into the emptiness construct is to try and view emptiness using the principles of interconnectedness and interdependent arising. And we touched on that before in the talk this morning. Let's use another example now, though. The human body, our human bodies comprise water and air and therefore wind and therefore rain and therefore clouds and trees and animals that we eat. Within the human body, if we look deeply, we should be able to find all things yet we, sh we can't find an intrinsically existing self. The human body, we, are empty of an inherently existing self, yet we are full of all things. In emptiness, there is fullness. In fullness, there is emptiness. I just want to introduce a caveat, a limitation, however, that arises when we use interconnectedness in order to try and elicit an understanding of emptiness because interconnectedness implies that two phenomena are connected to each other. Emptiness transcends the idea of connectedness. We need to use terms such as boundlessness. There, there is no connection between phenomena because there is no separation. And emptiness, in my opinion, is a pan-Buddhist concept. You may hear some scholars assert that non-self is primarily a Theravada concept. And emptiness is a Mahayana concept. Yet in the Theravada literature, in the Pali Canon, there are sutras specifically addressing and dealing with emptiness. And and we can also just use logic to kind of iron out that debate. If we accept that I, this self, is of the nature of non-self, so if we accept that non-self exists, then by log logical default, the object does not exist too. If there's no self, there's no other. 
So non-self implies emptiness. Let's use the word non-self or let's use the word emptiness. But we're talking about the same principle here. Just to help us understand this emptiness construct a little bit more, I'd like to relate it to mindfulness because mindfulness is perhaps certainly in, 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 the, in the research setting and in the clinical practice setting, probably the most renowned Buddhist technique at the moment, isn't it? Mindfulness is concerned with becoming aware of the present moment. So if we want to be a good mindfulness practitioner, we really need to know what this present moment is. We need to understand how it exists. The present moment can be divided into continuously smaller units of time. We can divide a second into a tenth of a second, into a millisecond, and we can divide that into a microsecond, and we can divide that into an attosecond and that into a yocto second, and so on and so forth, and we can continue to divide the present moment into infinitely smaller units of time. The fact is that the present moment is always changing. It never crystallizes into existence. It never stands still. Change implies that something changes from one state to another or from one position to another. But if the present moment never crystallizes into existence, how can it be undergoing change? Therefore, what present moment exists? The present moment is empty of inherent existence also. So I'll just run through some research studies that we've conducted into emptiness. I'll start with some that deal with the construct, first of all, and then I'll move on to some studies that explore the use of emptiness in psychotherapeutic context. So recently we conducted what we understand to be the first study ever to directly access, directly assess emptiness in human participants. We recruited 25 advanced Buddhist meditators. And that presented a challenge. How, how do you assess, how do you recruit an advanced Buddhist meditator? What criteria do you assign? Do you give them a psychometric test? Do you ask them how many years they've been meditating for? Is that a valid measure of meditative experience? I don't think so, because they could have one year 25 times. They may not have developed in their practice. Perhaps we could look at their title, but that doesn't tell us anything. So when you come across these studies using advanced meditators, be careful, because it's actually impossible to tell, including in our own study. We developed a semi-structured in interview that um, assessed those meditators understanding, pan-Buddhist understanding of emptiness. And we recruited, we, we used purposive sampling so that we could um, exploit links that we had through the Buddhist um, meditation community in both the monastic and, and lay settings. And in the end, we managed to get 25 individuals that met our criteria. We, we we recruited from all three of the major Buddhist vehicles, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana. And, and in order to get that many people who met the criteria for being an advanced meditator, that took us 12 months. And recruitment was global in scope. And uh, the study showed that the same meditators who partook in an emptiness meditation, they, the emptiness meditation outperformed the same individuals participating in a mindfulness meditation. So we used a within participants control condition. And they outperformed, emptiness outperformed mindfulness 
on outcome measures of non-attachment, mystical experiences, compassion, and positive and negative effect. We also conducted a concurrent qualitative study, and these themes emerged from the data set. It's probably better to look at them using this diagram that was the outcome of a grounded theory approach to qualitative research in this case. So the advanced Buddhist meditators, they used concentrated meditation in order to calm and still the mind. They then engaged in a process of investigative meditation in order to elicit an experience of emptiness. Whilst, in, whilst dwelling in emptiness, they, they had an altered perception of time and space. In emptiness, there was no time. There was no space. Emptiness elicited compassionate farsightedness. And they had volitional control. They remained in control of that meditation. They didn't zone out, for example. And the whole experience was spiritually meaningful for them, both during the meditation and after. I'll just share with you one or two of the participant quotes from that study that correspond to some of the themes I just talked about. One participant said, You keep peeling away new layers of wrapping, and each time you do, there's nothing to find. When I look, I see all things, but I don't see a self. Another participant said, a sense of responsibility and love springs up. It requires no effort. It's spontaneous. It's love for all things. It's compassion for all things. It's unconditional because it's infused with wisdom, with non-self. Another participant said, existence is happening. It's unfolding in front of you and you're watching it whilst dwelling in emptiness. But you're also part of it. You are it. You're dancing with it. It's so beautiful. All things and life forms are included in your view. There's no separation. There's no self. There's no other. And the sense of love and compassion is overwhelming. It comes naturally. Do you see? You touch every mind and atom with your heart and mind. And finally, one participant said, everything is of the nature of emptiness, but trying to find it is impossible because it means you're placing label on some th labels on something that can't be labeled. When we conceptualize emptiness, we lose sight of emptiness. We lose the essence of what emptiness embodies because we can't conceptualize it accurately. We conducted another study. This was the first study to investigate and identify something that we called the meditation-induced near-death experience. I'm sure most people here have come across the term near-death experience before. This was slightly different than a near-death experience. That often happens um, when people experience trauma, for example. Because in this case, the advanced Buddhist meditators, they voluntarily elicited that experience. They chose to do it using meditation. And that study was conducted over a three-year period. And actually, the meditation-induced near-death experience gave rise to a number of positive outcomes for those meditators, including a decrease in attachment or an increase in non-attachment, including an increase in mystical experiences. And over the course of the three-year period, they became more adept at this practice, suggesting that the meditation-induced near-death experience is something that can be learned. However, why I've included it here is because a, an embedded qualitative study also identified themes of emptiness. So one participant said, emptiness is the way things are. It's why you don't hold on. You experience something or someone, and you're fully involved in the experience. But you pull back and recognize that it's like a dream. It's dangerous not to do that. I think this participant here was alluding to attachment. Don't become attached. It's dangerous 
to become attached to things, according to this participant. Another participant said, the mind has unlimited potential, but it gets stuck in one way of seeing things. But when you die, the mind kind of goes through a process of unfolding. Its potential is unlocked. If you've trained enough, you can harness this potential. You can harness it before you die as well. But if you're not trained, and most people aren't, according to this participant, then death can be a frightening experience. Yet it's all just a, protect, a projection of the mind, the participant said. Again, alluding to this emptiness theme. Okay, let's, let's now explore a little bit. We'll do a quick kind of snapshot, snapshot of some research findings that I've I've kind of selected randomly, really, whereby we've used an intervention called meditation awareness training that my colleague Ed O'Shonen introduced this morning. And that intervention uses emptiness principles as part of the training. It uses emptiness to help individuals undermine their attachment to self. So let's, let's look at some findings from the use of that intervention in different contexts. And I've chosen um, different study designs here, just to kind of give you a, a, yeah, an overview, briefly. So this study in particular was with um, a female, it was a case study, a female suffering from co-occurring pathological gambling with schizophrenia. And across the course of the psychotherapy, she demonstrated clinically significant change in the relevant symptoms. So I think one of those scales there is the brief psychiatric rating scale. Another scale will be for gambling symptoms, mindfulness, and um, kind of general functioning. And she said, meditation makes me understand that thoughts and feelings have to dissolve. So I just relax the mind and don't hold on and they start to go away on their own. She was becoming less attached, and that strategy actually helped her with some very strong psychotic experiences that, um, that are consistent with the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. She was actually able to observe those psychotic processes, objectify them, and because she wasn't feeding them, they were able to dissolve. Another study, this was a, a, a controlled trial with adults suffering from workaholism. And um, they used the meditation awareness training intervention and showed reductions in workaholism symptomatology, improvements in job satisfaction, in work engagement. And importantly, they actually... Um, their, their job performance stayed the same, yet they were working less hours. That's an important outcome. So applying emptiness principles in the work setting, in the family setting, was demonstrated in this study to be productive. So there's a, there's a potential interest there, isn't there? A potential um, utility point for businesses, for corporations. Okay, that's just the mixed effect model for that study. The, the thick red line there will be for the control group and the thick blue line will be for the intervention group. So you can see there was a nice reduction in symptoms of workaholism in the intervention group that weren't observed in the control group. Another case study involved a director of a blue chip company earning a lot of money, and again, he, he, he was suffering from work addiction. He showed clinically significant change across the course of the intervention in the relevant outcome measures. And he said, meditation centers the mind and helps you see more angles, but it also helps you see the human in people. That may not sound like a particularly profound comment, but for this guy, it really was, because he was one of those chaps 
that on, would only ever talk about his own career and how good he was. And it was such a nice change to hear him share a different perspective on work and to actually start valuing people other than himself. Another clinical case study involved somebody suffering from sex addiction. And again, across the course of the intervention, there was clinically significant change in the relevant outcome measures, including in sleep quality, in um, job satisfaction, in depression, anxiety, stress, in sex addiction symptoms. But I want to highlight this, this outcome measure here. I've just kind of zoomed that up for you. Non-attachment scale we use. The non-attachment scale is based on, on a Buddhist model of attachment. And it assesses the extent to which an individual is attached to psychological, social, and material phenomena. And therefore, because it's assessing attachment to external phenomena, it's also atta assessing attachment to self. Because without self, there can't be an attachment to other. So it's a really useful measure for kind of starting to tap into directly assessing emptiness, directly assessing attachment to self and non-self, indirectly. And so their levels of non-attachment increased across the course of the intervention. In this study, we conducted a, an active controlled, randomized controlled trial with individuals suffering from fibromyalgia. That's a chronic pain disorder with associated psychological symptoms, in case you're not aware, such as um, depression, anxiety, stress, poor sleep quality are, are symptomatic of fibromyalgia as well as all over body pain. And the study, the intervention demonstrated significant improvements for the intervention group versus the control group across all of the outcome measures listed there, including pain, including civic engagement, the extent to which they're engaged with their community, and importantly, non-attachment. In fact, in this study, we conducted a mediation analysis. and I find this finding really interesting. That analysis showed that non-attachment mediated the effects of meditation on fibromyalgia symptoms. So what that means is that because individuals were becoming less attached to themselves through meditation, they were actually experiencing reductions in body pain. It implies a very, very strong link between body and mind, doesn't it? Um, we conducted another study, another randomized control trial, this time with middle managers, so managers kind of at a, at a mid-level in the organization with a very senior manager above them and, um, and, and workers beneath them. I think in this case it was all office, office workers. And again, the study led to, showed that meditation versus the control group led to significant improvements in the relevant outcome measures, in this case, including job performance. That, in this study, as I recall, was measured via managers, line managers, by the manager's direct line manager. So it's moving towards more of an objective measure of job performance, as well as improvements in well-being. So that just um, shows graphically there um, a nice fall off in depression, anxiety, and stress symptoms for the intervention group out across three time points before, after, and I think in this case it was a six-month follow-up, and that same pattern of effects weren't shown for the control group. We also, conduct, we also embedded a qualitative study into this particular um, middle manager's research project, and we identified something that we called the phenomena feedback effect. It appeared that as the managers were more able to let go of themselves. They were better able to 
engage with the present moment, to communicate with the present moment, according to their own words. This is what they said. It's as if meditation helps you to talk and communicate with situations around you. I don't mean talking with words, but there starts to be a tacit understanding between you and the situation you're in. It's as though the situation is on your side, even if it's a tough situation. Another participant said, you begin to sense how things have to unfold. You become aware of the conditions around you. It's as though things happen deliberately by accident. Almost like reality has a sense of humor at the ultimate level. And you can play and dance with it if you're tuned in enough. And so it seemed that by a letting go of self, by taking ego out of the equation, participants were able to tune into the present moment more clearly, they were able to see more clearly how the present moment might unfold. Nothing to do with being clairvoyant, just simply to do with being aware. And I want to change tack a little bit after having done a, a very brief fly through some relevant research outcomes. And I want to share with you an emptiness perspective on the five precepts. What I call the hidden aspects, or what we call the hidden aspects of the five precepts. In case you're not aware, the five, I suspect many people here are, or are aware, but the five precepts are five guidelines that are common, I think, across most Buddhist traditions as to how we should live our lives in a manner that's beneficial to us and beneficial to others. Five very basic guidelines. And actually similar guidelines occur in other religions as well. The first one is that we should abstain from killing. The emptiness aspect of that precept is that we should abstain from killing the Buddha within. We have a voice inside of us. That voice is calling us, it's pleading with us to explore emptiness, to explore inside of ourselves. Because in emptiness, that's where we find fullness. And if we don't listen to that voice, we kill it. We kill, we kill the Buddha inside of us. The second precept is that we should abstain from stealing, abstain from taking things that aren't ours. The emptiness aspect of that precept, the hidden aspect, is that we should abstain from stealing from ourselves the opportunity to spiritually evolve, the opportunity to attain enlightenment. And we, we steal from ourselves that opportunity when, when we don't explore our true nature, when we don't explore the true nature of the present moment. And we also steal from others that opportunity when we don't embrace the present moment and investigate the present moment. The third precept is that we should abstain from lustful contact. The emptiness aspect of that precept is that we should abstain from lusting after a me, a mine, and an I. We have to transcend me, mine, and I. We have to let go of our egos. We have to take ego out of the equation. We have to leave ego outside the meditation hall along with our shoes. Because if we, if we try to practice any form of spiritual development, let's take mindfulness as an example, and there's lots of ego in the equation, then, then that's going to impair our ability to progress. It's going to introduce confusion 
into the mind. It's going to, it's going to divert us from a wholesome path. The fourth precept is that we should abstain from false speech. The emptiness aspect of that precept, I would say, is that we should abstain from false speech by giving meditation teachings on subjects that we have not directly realized. And this is an issue. This is an issue now more than ever before. There's so many mindfulness teachers, for example, now. Some of them are good. Some of them aren't. Some of them are teaching not from an experiential perspective. And they're doing more harm than good. As a, as a community of meditation practitioners, we need to be aware of this issue. We need to ensure, at least for ourselves, that we are practicing and we're teaching from experience. That's how we really empower people to practice effectively. Finally, the fifth precept is that we should abstain from ingesting intoxicants. That could be um, drugs, for example, that uh, intoxicate the mind. The emptiness aspect of that precept, the hidden aspect of that precept, is that we should abstain from intoxicating our and others' minds with concepts, clever ideas, and wrong views. Concepts and clever ideas include emptiness. We have to live emptiness. We have to experience it. We have to breathe it. We teach emptiness through our practice. We teach it through the way we walk, through the way we breathe. That's how we share the practice of emptiness. We have to let go of of owning, of being attached to clever concepts, including even of being attached to being a meditator or being attached to being a Buddhist. We have to use emptiness. If we become attached to it, it will use us. That concludes my talk. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Are there any questions? So you mentioned earlier about um, uh, mythical experiences or perspectives. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yes, that was um, in the study or the two studies using advanced meditation practitioners. In fact, it's a scale. It's called the mystical experiences scale. And it taps into... It taps into ideas such as transcending the self. Being able to perceive beyond this world, whatever that might mean for that participant. Feelings of, of profound calm. Feelings of compassion. Those are some of the items included in, in that scale. So I think mystical, maybe we could use the word spiritual also. May I ask, how can you use the practice of emptiness to help patients with mental disorder? Thank you. I think, most importantly, the counsellor or the therapist has to discern whether that particular patient is at the right stage to to be introduced to emptiness, because if they're not, it could do much more harm than good. And that counsellor or psychotherapist has to ask themselves, are they at the right stage to work with this practice, this technique also? That said, I think we've found from our own studies, and there's been a number of them that have used this technique, all we're introducing individuals to here is a truth, a scientific truth, because it's a scientific fact that we don't exist independently. 
we inter-exist. In fact, quantum physics now, there's been papers published that have shown that a, a, a thin piece of semiconductor material can, can be made to vibrate at two different energy states simultaneously, which is the kinetic equivalent of it being at, in two places simultaneously, yet in no place at any one point of time. It's Quantum physics now is tapping into emptiness also. So I think when individuals understand that, we're introducing them to a truth of science, a truth of nature. They're, they're okay with that when, when, they, when they comprehend it. Because generally speaking, when we, when we don't live in accord with the truths of nature or the truths of the universe, that generally leads to suffering. Because we're not, we're not being truthful with ourselves. It might lead to suffering for ourselves or for others. Hi. Uh, forgive me if you're going to um, explain this already in like a workshop tomorrow, but then in case I can't go or some of us cannot go, how important would you say is the introduction of that concept of emptiness to someone who has not done any sort of research in Buddhism, you know, and when they hear this, how would you separate the immediate presumption they have that they have to undergo at, at the very least some sort of training for it to have any meaningful impact in their life? Yes, that's a good question. Personally, one, once we've assessed that that participant or that group of participants is at the right stage in their life to introduced to this teaching we introduce it as the very first thing because as I mentioned before within emptiness there is fullness and, and we approach it from that angle and from the angle of it being a universal truth we, we, we plant the seed at the very first stage and throughout the training program we, we nurture that seed we water it and the understanding grows. Hopefully, a, an introductory experiential understanding grows. So we, we do it early on with care, with love, and with compassion, and with wisdom. Are there any more questions? I have um, a logical question. Um, I think it's really hard to develop measures of uh, effectiveness, such as you were mentioning about the non-attachment measures. Um, because the, it's very hard to find another instrument which has already been validated to validate this new instrument, because a, a, lot of, a lot of the concepts are very different. So my question is, how do you overcome that? And uh, as a social science, uh, I suppose you would be using, because all the controls and everything, um, in social science research there are very uh, stringent requirements and how are you, um, how, how are the, the researchers uh, tackling this uh, question of methodology? Thank you. Thanks, that's another good question. Um, in fact, we can design the most methodologically watertight study but there's, there isn't a study out there without limitations. And whenever we, we devise one of these psychometric tests, we, we're automatically we're engaging in a process of reduction. And those are limitations inherent in the study. We try to overcome them, however, by embedding the qualitative component, whereby you can speak to the participant, the individual, the human being, whereby you can explore their experiences, talk about them, and, and kind of enter into that participant's life world. And so we always try and balance the quantitative and the kind of strictly empirical approach with, with, with the qualitative approach also. But even then, there are limitations. You have just said that uh, when the person is ready, we can introduce the emptiness. Uh, so based on what evidence we can tell the person is ready? 
because I would try to <laughs> introduce evidence to many people that I, I think is very difficult. So how to judge if the person is ready to, ask, to accept this? You have to use your skill and experience and compassion as a therapist, as a counsellor. And you make a choice. Well, if the person, uh, you have just said that uh, the, the person is, is to be ready to accept truth. Uh, what about the person is uh, something like a psychosis? Um, in fact, I think many people, it's quite difficult to accept the reality. So, uh, so the question is, I have to be ready. <laughs> Rather than the person is ready to accept. And both has to be. Both have to be ready. We've delivered this intervention under research conditions to individuals with psychosis. In fact, sometimes individuals with psychosis, even outside of any kind of psychotherapeutic context, when they're sharing, when they're explaining their experience of psychosis, they make reference to experiences of emptiness, and they use that term. They're, they're experiencing emptiness that traditionally the scientific community deemed was, was a false view, was an erroneous view. But perhaps, perhaps it's not. Perhaps there's more wisdom in that experience than we think. But ultimately, it's, it's, the, it's the teachers, the therapists, the counsellors choice. It can't be anybody else's. Thank you. You have just mentioned that it may be dangerous to introduce emptiness to a person. Can you elaborate a little bit more? How dangerous? If a person isn't ready, or if yeah. the teacher yeah. isn't ready, it no, can do the person, harm. If the, person, if the patient is not ready yes. to accept emptiness. Then we wouldn't introduce it. Uh, but you mentioned it may be dangerous. How, how dangerous? If we... If we set somebody on a path that they're not ready for, or if we're not ready to set them on their path, then it'll, it'll harm that person. It will increase confusion rather than decrease it. But I can't answer that because it's, it's so specific to every individual. Are there any further questions or do we have time for any more questions? I think we'll, did you want to catch me later on? I think we'll have to conclude. Is that okay? Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Gelden, for your inspiring presentation. Um, uh, if you have more questions, maybe uh, you can um, interact with Dr. Van Gelden later. So uh, for the next section, I would like to introduce to you Professor Liang Tian and Dr. George Lee, who are the faculty member of our Master of Buddhist Counseling program here in HKU. Professor Tian is a licensed psychologist at the Washington State, certified by American Board of Professional Psychology, the ABPP, with a specialty in couples and family. She served on the Washington State Psychological Association's Ethics Committee as a member for seven years and as chair of the committee for three years. She is the corresponding author of the book Ethics for Psychologists, a Casebook Approach, which has been adopted as a professional ethics textbook for many doctoral programs in clinical psychology. Dr. George Lee is a licensed clinical psychologist in California. His publications cover the areas of Buddhist mindfulness practices, application of Buddhist practices to psychotherapy, acculturation and family conflicts, and international student psychology. His current research interests include applied Buddhism for professional psychology, interpretation of early Buddhist teachings for mental health professionals, and Buddhist counseling. The topic that they will present today is Chitta Psychotherapy, a theoretical orientation based on early Buddhist teachings. So without further ado, please join me to give a big hand to welcome them to this lunch.
Is this on? Ah. Since there's two of us, we're going to be moving around with microphones as opposed to standing right here. Okay, uh, this is, let's see. What we're going to be covering today, we're both uh, practicing psychologists as well as, uh, as academics. So what we're doing is taking you from the theory actually into the room and what do a psychologist and a client actually talk about. So let's see if we can take a peek into the actual treatment room. So today we're going to talk about what is a theoretical orientation and then the Buddha, what is psychotherapy versus the Buddhist practice. And then we're going to introduce some counseling skills, basic counseling skills. And these counseling skills can be used in any sort of theoretical orientation, any counseling session. And then how we integrate Buddhist concepts with, uh, with the basic counseling skills. And then finally, there are some techniques that are used uh, that is unique to uh, from Buddhism, and we'll be talking just briefly talking about that. So one is uh, what is a theoretical orientation? If we're posing the fact that we're introducing a Buddhist uh, a theoretical orientation that is that is uh, based on Buddhism, first is we have to talk about what is a theoretical orientation. So. A theoretical, this is something that is not uh, from published literature. I did a lit review trying to figure out, you know, just reference someone saying what a theoretical orientation is, and I couldn't find one. So from all the sort of previous knowledge as well as that particular search, this is what I've concluded, that theoretical orientation is a worldview. Uh, and it is a uh, worldview that w you you just it's like putting on a lens. That's your it's your lens, and the best theoretical orientation matches the worldview of the culture of the client. So most of the theoretical orientation that has been that that's been used in traditional uh, you know European based uh, culture psychology has been better matched with that particular Christian base. And uh, the, it's not particularly mat well matched with the Buddhist, Buddhism culture base. So we're saying that a theoretical orientation in its most ideal form should be culturally congruent with the client, with the client in which uh, you're serving. So what, there are three elements in any theoretical orientation. One is, what is an ideal person? What is a healthy person? Meaning, if we're going to be treating somebody, where are we going to go with them? How do we know that they're, they're finally done? Or how do we know that somebody should be in treatment? And then another one is, how do they get there? What is normal development? And then, well, what happened? What is pathology? And uh, how did pathology occur? And therefore, how do you get them out of the pathology into a healthy person? So we're just doing the, give you a very, very brief example based on the, some of the fairly traditional theoretical orientation. I am no one and I admit that this is really, really simplistic. So if you're going to say, well, that's too simplistic, you're right. This is just for the purpose of doing a very brief overview to give you a flavor of what, what it looks like. So in uh, so for analytic, psychoanalytic, what is a healthy ideal? Freud say someone who is able to work and love. A healthy ideal person is someone who can ne negotiate all of uh, negotiate uh, through their work life and their love life so that they can be a functional person. And the, what is normal development? Normal development and in, 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 you know, attachment theory and uh, drive theory that sort of went into attachment theory basically, very basically say, we come into this world. We have things that we need because we are you know, an embodied being. So from a little baby, we need food. And eventually, we need more and more and more things. So normal development is that as we, as we grow, Society has certain demands of what a person is. So the normal development is that uh, based on what it is I need and based on what society needs from me, that I'm able to negotiate it in a way that I can continue to function 
in society, and that's called uh, defense mechanisms. You know, more uh, sophisticated defense mechanism. Normal development is going to get more and more sophisticated. You, you're going to be, uh, become more sophisticated in your defense mechanisms. And pathology is when oh, went too far. Is when your defense mechanisms is unable to negotiate between your own needs and that of the demands of society. That's a very brief thing. And then the next one that's fairly traditional is CBT. So, so CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, as cognitive come first, it assumes that the role of thinking, belief, meaning can impact how you feel and your behaviors. That's the traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. And how a healthy ideal, a healthy person would be someone who is like a scientist, who is carefully, accurately, and objectively seeing what evidence is one take to build a belief. When a person is able to be objective in seeing the evidences in how to create a person's identity, that person will be healthy. For example, uh, if I know that I have done these good things, there are so many things that I've succeeded in, and there's something that I'm a failure, when looking at two things objectively, realistically, I come up with a self-concept of or core belief of, oh, I'm pretty competent. So that's the objective perspective. And when Normal development, when a person, when a kid grow up, we expect the kid to gain the emotional and cognitive maturity to be able to see things in an objective, realistic way. But pathology is because of our experiences in life. We are not objective anymore. We are biasing ourselves to certain kind of evidences. We may catastrophize them. We may make it bigger than it is. We may avalize them so that it will impact our mood. For example, there are a lot of good things that I've done. There are a few bad things that I do, but I hyper focus on the bad things that I do, which make me depressed, which make me anxious. So that's the pathology. And as a therapist, what CBT emphasizes is to do a collaborative empiricism. Basically, a therapist is working with a client to help the clients to learn a scientific perspective so the person would know how to move away from one's bias and look at the data, the evidences of his or her life more objectively. When a person is able to have an objective, realistic view of evidences to build up a self, that would be more healthy. So that's a little bit of CBT. So the next one, uh, major theoretical orientation is family systems. So what is healthy ideal? And a healthy ideal, again, is someone who is able to interact with all the layers of society. As you see the between schools and your family, and then religious affiliation, and then you're able to negotiate in, the, in your political, you know, like if you're in Hong Kong, you're in, within the Hong Kong setting and that the normal development is that from the very early stages when you're a baby, you're only at the center because you're only at interacting with one person, your, your care provider. And then you go, and then you grow up and you go to school and then you're interacting with the microsystem. So uh, normal development is someone who is uh, able to, as they grow, enlarge their circle of interaction and functional in all of those circles of, of um, interactions. And then what is pathology is that you are unable to function within a circle, uh, within any of the systems. So let's say that um, my family, you know, I, I grew up and I was fairly abused and I learned that being uh, physical uh, physical confrontation is normal and I go out into society and I start hitting the person who, you know, offended me. That's not very functional because the, you interact with the laws in the society and society says, no, 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 you can't do that. So that is pathology per the uh, family systems. And what we're now talking about is what is the one that we borrow from Buddhism and by the way, we're saying that this is Sita psychotherapy because when we, when we started this with uh, Buddhist, Buddhist counseling, Buddhist psychotherapy, and the feedback we kept on getting was that, oh, 
I'm not Buddhist. Oh, no, don't tell me about Buddhism. No, I don't meditate. So we gave up on the title Buddhist <laughs> counseling or therapy or whatever and picked something that probably nobody knows, which is except for, uh, for Buddhists. <laughs> 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 so we're also looking for a more appropriate title. If you think, can think of it, let us know. So what is the elements of a theory that would be uh, for Buddhism? What is a healthy ideal? And this is something that, as polar scholars and practitioners, you'll, you'll be familiar with. Uh, understand how the mind is constructed, OK? And then what is normal development? You're going to take that one. So normal development habits formed from life, if lived experiences, it could be from a previous life, but after you were born in this life, all your life experiences, your choices, whether you're aware or unaware of that, they kind of cultivate and reinforce a habitual pattern in you. And that's normal, even though our habits lead us to unwholesome decisions or things that lead to dukkha, that's a part of non normal development because under the Buddhist assumption, we are all suffering. There are a lot of dukkha. So we are normally ignorant and sick. And what is pathology? So uh, every one of us have suffering, but that's not the definition of pathology. <laughs> that would be uh, that there is a rigidity in the identification with the constructor self. Rigidity as in, this is me. And then you go into another situation, and that particular me doesn't fit so well and doesn't, can't negotiate very well with that next situation or next moment. That is pathology. OK, so I thought we had. OK, so, so in the, doing a theoretical orientation, the purpose for it is to do actual psychotherapy. So what, so what is the difference between psychotherapy and Buddhism and Buddhist practice? So the goal? So one thing is that the, in psychotherapy, psychotherapy originally a Western concept. It emphasizes a professional relationship in which there will be therapeutic alliance. There will be a trusting, safe environment that a psychotherapist is helping the client, and then the interventions and technique would depend on the therapist's theoretical orientation. In Buddhist practice, there will be, usually there are guidance from the master, but I think it's much more internal, introspective for self-advancement. And the way that we're applying that is, one thing is the goal for Buddhist practice is to aim for reducing suffering, but long-term goal is for liberation, is for nibbana, is for removal of all suffering, right? That's why we become Buddhist. But in chitta psychotherapy, we are not trying to liberate all of our clients. I really want to, but we are not doing that. What we are trying to do is we use the same teachings and same path, but then we help the client reduce their suffering, increase their happiness in the conventional world. We use the same way to guide them. They walk the same path, but then they have decision to where to stop. So that's a brief way to, to, to describe our distinguishment. So here comes the definition of psych psychotherapy. Again, this is a working definition, and please, we are welcoming input to that. Chitta psychotherapy is a theoretical orientation driven by early Buddhist teachings. Being a condition for change, Chitta psychotherapists aim to help clients see reality as it is, thereby dissolving clients clinging to their five aggregates and resulting in clients' subjective experiences of suffering reduction. There are three main requirements for Chitta psychotherapists. The first, self-cultivation through Buddhist practice. Second, applying the practice into psychotherapy, not just practicing yourself. You need to know how to skillfully apply to your clients. And finally, regular psychological counseling skills. Those three are essential. So the par first paragraph is aimed at what it is that, the, uh, that the, we're trying to achieve for the client. The second paragraph is what is required for someone to practice this, to use this particular approach. So counseling skills, what counseling skills are we talking about? And these are sort of counseling skills that have been used in for psychology, for counseling, for... Um, for management, for school guidance, for any ways that you want to talk to people, or even in bars, in talking to 
sorry. <laughs> yes, you can use these skills for talking to your boss, for coaching, and it's fairly uh, widespread. You can get on Google and just uh, and uh, and and Google something that's called counseling and micro skills. So these are the ones that we have chosen, observation, paraphrasing, questioning, summarizing, and seeking concurrence. What does each one of those mean? So observation are the nonverbals. Uh, you have the physical, the first thing that somebody comes in with, the first thing you notice is whether they're male, female, how big, how small, overweight, underweight, me, okay, I do all of this. <laughs> and your impression of their presence, whether they're slumped like this and they're bound to be sort of somewhat depressed or they're bouncing all over the place and you're starting to think, is there a hyperness going on here? Or, and then there's also the body language and the expressions. And so these are the nonverbal observations. And these are, you know, if you go on Google and read uh, you know, uh, what is a coach, uh, how to coach, or what is your coaching, yeah. coaching for uh, effectiveness or whatever. You have all of these kinds and, of information. And as clinical psychologists, we are trained that the first moment we're in contact with you, we start this assessment to get to know you from how you're walking in, the, the transportation you take, do you know time, place, your name, all that. Those are all part of the observations. So then there's prayer phrasing, and this part is sort of like the one that is fairly traditionally in, uh, in, in, in psychology. And then what we've sort of chose, uh, translated of in Buddhist terms is that paraphrasing is where you say, what does the client say? And that is your sense object, exactly what the client said. And then is, what did I hear the client say? And the ability to make the distinction is something that we're, require, we're asking the counselor to do. And oftentimes, we're finding, myself included, we're finding that it's very difficult to make sure that you make the, you're able to make the distinction between sense object and sense contact. And then, uh, then you say it back to the client. That's uh, Buddhism applied to paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. Questioning, uh, the approaches for, que and of course, you know, in your dialogue with your client, you're always going to be asking them questions. And the questions should be, oh, what happened? Open-ended. Don't, unless you're asking something like, what, what is your age? And, uh, <laughs> and are you tired today? The questioning should be open-ended. And then the other thing about the, Questioning is uh, we're recommending for this approach is that it, you ask them only actuals. There are lots of uh, sort of uh, coaching kind of stuff uh, says envision, envision the, the best you that you want to be. Uh, what would that be like? This one is thing, you see things as they are, only what is, what is here and only what happened before. So open in a question about what happened before actual. And then you put that together and you summarize it, you paraphrase it, with, and then note their feeling. And then you say to them, OK, is that true? This is what I heard. And then you go, did I hear right? And you keep on doing that until you concur there is concurrence, so that you actually know as the, uh, as the counselor, the sense object, meaning what the client said, and what I heard, sense contact, are the same. Those are the basic counseling skills that we're introducing or bringing into this particular t approach. Okay, so what we did, in, uh, we also te been teaching some of this, and our students keep on saying, what exactly is that? You know, how do we do that? And how, what exactly are you looking for? So 
we put together a basic counseling skills uh, checklist. And here is the checklist. And uh, these are kind of things that, see, the first one is physical. The first one is relationship establishment, meaning this is a counseling, real professional relationship, and so on and so forth. So I think that this is probably posted, so we're not going to go through all of this. Mm -hmm. But you can see it. You hear that all of the counseling skills you can practice on your own and you can observe the other person to see if they actually did it. And in using these, so now we have a whole bunch of counseling skills, all sorts of micro skills. And then what are you going to use it for? So these are the skills that are being applied to uh, Buddhist space and used as a theoretical orientation in psychotherapy. So we're saying, well, what is that? There are philosophical assumptions that we are taking directly from Buddhism. And the, uh, and to you, the, so the question is, OK, use it for what? Use it for understanding conditions. Meaning phenomena. What is what exactly? What is uh, involved in any moment in any situation? And if we're saying understand uh, conditions, then there we need to operationalize it. What conditions needs to be understood? So the core of Buddhism is a concept called dependent core arising, right? I think. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We didn't get our order right. <laughs> okay, you go first. No, you go. Okay. So uh, the counseling skills are just tools. They are, they, are, they are not lively by themselves. They are not bounded to any kind of uh, treatment or usage. But we are using that in concurrent to the Buddhist assumptions of the world, which we labeled three main ones. The first one is the five aggregate subjective clinging. The second one is karma, the interconnectedness, and finally the dependent core arising. Yeah, all these concepts uh, throughout the day, you've heard, uh, you've been listening to all the various uh, emphasis on certain uh, elements of that and the usage of that, how that has been applied, and so we're not going to. Uh, uh, we're okay. So, so it, this should not be new to any of you. So this is just a direct quote about what is uh, depending on the color rising coming, uh, taking from the sutras. And then as it's applied to. As it applies to understanding a client, the way to use it may be a little different. Like this morning, there was a situation of, say, like a woman who is depressed because she found out that she has cancer. The thing is, we just know the phenomenon of she is suffering from depression. The only cause we know is a cancer diagnosis. But in fact, from a perspective of um, dependent core arising, we know that there's always multiple conditions that contribute to one phenomenon. What about financial stress? What about a family? What about her uh, values about life? What about other family relationships, her peers practice? What about all the things that happened before? What about all the things that happened before so that contributed to one single experience? So we would just look at one experience, it wouldn't explain for all. And yet most of the people are just rigidly focusing on some of the condition and think that's all. And so the reminder of the uh, Abhidharma's translation of the dependent call arising, you apply that to any situation, any phenomenon that a client comes in talking about. So and a client is going to come in talking about myself. Uh, and uh, we heard earlier the, the addiction, uh, ontological addiction. That's what a client comes in talking about the self and my suffering. And what uh, psychotherapy is not doing is that we're not looking at the person, the person as an objective, but we talk to the person about how they conceive of themselves. And we start with the, you know, the, what uh, we all understand as the constructive self, which is composed of the five, six aggregates. Five, 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 aggregates. five <laughs> aggregates, but six form bases. Right. Yeah. And then in, in what, what we're 
operationalizing for uh, psycho uh, say conditions phenomena is the combination of the ecological theory taken from family systems, and then we put them with our uh, Buddhism, the five aggregates, right in the middle. So when we say, use the counseling skills for uh, understanding phenomena, what we're saying is operationalizing what, do you, what exactly are you asking a client to, to look at is, or what exactly are you trying to figure out in any one moment? And so for any one moment as you're talking to a client, you should be able to see that particular phenomena, that moment in the chronosystem, in the microsystem, in the exosystem, in the mesosystem, in the microsystem and beliefs about the person, about themselves in relationship to other, about themselves in relation to themselves, and uh, the, the subjective experience of whatever the moment is, and then all the aggregates. So one of the exercises we have is, uh, we have put all of this in one sheet and an exercise is, I think we have it here, right? The conditions sheet. Uh, we do, here. And this exercise, what it really does is that you take all of that and then you pick one moment. You can do this exercise for yourself, but the, as a counselor, you do this with a client, no matter what the, no, we can't get, find it. Oh, okay. We had it all out for you. <laughs> so, so the exercise is that for any one moment, you should be able to say all of it, every single one of those things that we've just listed. And that is the operationalization of what we mean by phenomena and using your counseling skills to determine with, oh, there it is. Yeah, using your counseling skills to determine with the client any, uh, whatever, th whatever situation they're coming to talk to you about. So a client comes in, I am miserable, I'm depressed, uh, my, my boss is horrible, um, I, you know, my husband doesn't love me anymore, and I'm thinking about a divorce, whatever it is, take that moment and be able to do, answer the question you know, analyze the moment in all of the layers. That is the operationalization for what we mean by conditions and phenomena. Every moment in time has all the elements in this list that is operationalized. Okay, so <clears throat> this is all theory and it's great for theory, and then it's like, okay, what exactly do you do with all this? So here is a transcript. We're gonna show you this transcript. This is an excerpt, uh, excerpt from an actual case transaction. This is when a client of mine in a session. So we're, we were gonna print it out for you, but it would require too many killing of trees, so we're gonna just show it to you. Okay, we have so go ahead and, yeah. <laughs> and go ahead and just take a moment to read it.
if you can't read every single word, that's okay. Basically, the idea is that a client comes in, she's had an interaction, and she says, I have a temper. And she basically wants to engage me in a conversation about that her temper and then to help her not have these temper and not be uh, you know, someone who gets angry. And so in applying the theory is that where this one particular example is that it excerpt is where we go right to the moment, what exactly happened. It's not about whether you have a temper or not. Go to the moment, find the moment, which the moment is the phenomena of having a conversation with her, uh, with her brother. And then feeling tone, I was irritated. And then we start piecing it together there where it was, okay, what exactly irritated you? What was the cause of that irritation? What were you aware of? Circling around that moment, that particular phenomenon, and then talking about different perceptions. And as we talk about different perceptions, she, step, she's a, she st starts stepping away from that rigidity of the identification with feeling, I am a temperamental person or I have a temper. And to, and to just being able to examine that particular moment as a phenomena, and with the examination of that particular moment as a phenomena, the world opens up for different possibilities. And I didn't say it, the therapist didn't say it. We didn't have to challenge her perception of herself as someone with a temper. She then just arrived at, oh, I could do that. Oh, you mean I would be sort of that would be a calm, logical person instead of being a person with a temper. For the psycho psychotherapy, we're not we're not trying to change the person in saying you really don't have a self. There is an emptiness. This is just phenomena. It's just to reduce suffering. And if she starts changing her perception, uh, you know, self-label to something that she's more comfortable with and reduces her subjective sense of suffering, that's good. Okay. Did you want to say anything? No. So uh, just for some of the participants may not be uh, studying a lot of uh, uh, this model of Buddhism, five aggregates, we exist because we cling onto the five aggregates and at any moment, just like this moment, Usually, we have a pattern to cling on one of the aggregates, and then what that usually causes suffering. So we have the nama rupa, the body, feeling, perception, and mental formation and consciousness. In this client, the conceptualization is she is suffering, she is irritated, she is depressed because she has clinged onto the perception of I am an ill-tempered person. Because of that conception, what people say to her her brother, her mother, what happened is when they blame her, she would take the blame and continue to blame herself and aggregate all the suffering. So meaning that the perception of herself clinging onto that perception as an ill-tempered person started all those kinds of suffering. That's why that's the entry point that we want to help her see how she created that kind of self that create a suffering and use different ways, such as uh, you're a fly watching the situation. Or what about this perspective? What about that perspective? When she examines different ways that she can form perception, she find a more wholesome, less suffering way to form a new perception at the end. So this is what we do. We do not push them or force her to do anything. We open up the possibilities by reflecting, by questioning, by paraphrasing, and introducing new perspectives. And the, remember back to our definition of psychotherapy. In the definition for what it is that you're trying to do, nothing about a client needing to be Buddhist, needing to know about emptiness, needing to be introduced to Buddhism. It is the counselor who needs to, to be able to do this and have your own practice and be able to recognize the aggregates and the conditions and phenomena. And this is what the counselor needs to be able to recognize in the client. This is the uh, this is the uh, from the quote from the sutra, and be able to implement this sutra 
If I am the counselor, I need to be able to figure out in myself as well as the client, when the client comes in and starts talking, exactly how to differentiate this. Okay? So, what are some of the interventions that are unique? We've just talked about, okay, we're, we have all the counseling skills that, that is from sort of in the ethosphere <laughs> that we've been talking about, a lot of play, places talk about. And we've been talking about Buddhism, very basic Buddhist uh, principles, and then one example of how that is actually applied in the room. So then the other question is, okay, are there anything that is unique in ter besides the theoretical orientation that is unique uh, to, from Buddhism? And it's the, one is the theory, is that we're talking about the self and the interaction between self and external, and that the subjective experience of suffering comes between, between the interactions and that the pathology is that the, your, the perception of self is not flexible enough and to meet the conditions of the, of the moment, and that is where the suffering is experienced. And that is the dukkha. That is where between reality and my perception of myself. And the goal for treatment is to simply Cut that a little bit, right? And in cutting that, this is the rigidity of this is my, I am this, this is myself, then you, the suffering is reduced. Psychotherapy is not the same as, as Buddhist practice. So the Buddhist intervention that, con that contributes to this particular approach that would be used by a Buddhist counselor these are, these are examples of, uh, of interventions from other, kind, other theoretical orientations. It's a free-for-all. Any, any, uh, any uh, intervention should be used. For, for, for example, free association, you borrow from psychoanalytic. Uh, empty chair, you borrow from Fritz Perls. Uh, dream analysis, you can do that too. Uh, family genograms, maybe sometimes that helps. Visualization, that uh, you know, the visualize your best self or whatever from CBT, but visualization would be very different. Worksheets and uh, Socratic uh, questioning, any methodology. We're again, we're teaching using technique. It's like having a screwdriver. It doesn't matter whether the screwdriver is made out of wood or made out of steel or made out of gold. Yeah, you know, it's still going to do the same thing. So the techniques uh, are, you can borrow from anywhere. And then the ones that are unique from here that I say that Buddhism is contributing. And this is something that previous uh, and other, uh, other presenters have talked about is meditation. So if we're using meditation, then we're directing the mind's attention to the breath. Visualization. So visualization, uh, similar technique, but then what we do is say like when you have different sensation, you have different five aggregates combination get um, uh, triggered. Paying attention to that place, visualizing how it is, help you articulate what causes it, help you articulate the conditions. For example, like depression, when you just talk about depression, if you just focus on the body, there may be different tension, heat, exhaustion, discomfort, or pain that comes. If you do not pay attention to those kind of places, then you may not know what makes your depression. However, sometimes people cannot just articulate like that. Visualizations can give different body parts a voice as an entry point to talk about more in-depth, more creatively, more detached way of the experiences. And chanting, I would say that's another way to train someone's attention. If your mind cannot be trained to pay attention, you'll be lost in your flow of consciousness, keep chasing unwholesome, suffering-induced thoughts along the way without any ability to ground yourself to look at different perspectives. But chanting is one of the way, for example, um, just by that, 
you look much more awake, you're looking at me, you're gathering your attention at this moment, right? Exactly, this is what I mean. And that can be a good object of meditation to enhance our awareness to do any work of self-analysis of a pisana. These techniques, in addition to the previous techniques that we were talking about from other uh, theoretical orientations, the unique my uh, my uh, conclusion about the unique contribution that techniques from Buddhism is that we're training to the mind to attend to what is now. Right. So in repetition of repeating the definition of what is sita psychotherapy. It is not the skills, it is the goal, the orientation that any techniques, any skills you use should be congruent to the way to help clients see reality as it is. To see all the internal, external conditions, to see how one phenomenon, maybe depression, maybe anxiety, maybe any kind of dukkha, how it arises, how it changes, how it sees, see the courses. When people get the insight, their suffering will be reduced. And it is the counselor who's who is noting them and calling the client's attention to it. We're not training the client to uh, for the Buddhist practice. The counselor has to be the one that does this and then apply it in a clinical situation. Okay, okay. that's Okay, that's it for our presentation. Thank you. Okay, we're being told that we can do a short period of question and answer. So, any questions? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that not, because people are leaving now. Hi, um, can I go? I um, just want to know if you have any experience um, counseling or giving therapy to people with autistic traits, uh, whether uh, you have encountered any complications with them using this method and whether it's effective. Hmm. Any, any experiences with autistic spectrum disorder? Any practical experiences? We, we have not. We are just developing this approach. But we have experiences applying that to a client with psychotic symptoms, auditory hallucination. Of course, that, that is a very different psychological disorder, but we find that the same rationale to help client be very carefully, clearly know the sense contact, to know what things actually elicit different sensations in the body, different feeling, different perception, and jump into mental formation is helpful because from our uh, theoretical assumption, psychotic symptoms is actually a manifestation of mental formation we may interpret the stillness differently. Sometimes, like this kind of voice, you may see is a knocking on the board. But people who have psychotic symptoms have a habitual pattern to think someone is coming after them, is dangerous. But with chitta psychotherapy, they are able, he is able to come back more to the senses before drawing a conclusion that danger is coming. He is able to see more and examine more whether this is actually a correct way to see this as a danger. Yeah, and the application is actually very limited right now because we're just beginning to train. And the, there we have a group of three of us who are trained and applying it, getting, getting transcripts and seeing how exactly to apply it. We have the theory. The theory has been around for 2,500 years. And, and so now is uh, doing actual in interventions, actual treatment. So we have uh, had the experience of having a client with uh, symptoms of psychosis. Uh, we have had the experience of applying it with clients with anxiety, clients with depression, and uh, clients with uh, manic depressive illness. And I saw one hand, oh, sorry, two hands, right? Oh, no, you do. <laughs> Hello. Both in theory and practice, any difference between meditation-based Buddhist counseling and just Buddhist counseling? I, I don't think uh, any 
meditation-based counseling would be so bold enough to say that we are just pushing for non-self. I think it usually meditation-based counseling with more Buddhist teachings, like what we are doing, would be able to do that. Um, from my understanding of many meditation, I mean, mindfulness-based interventions, they may take mindfulness as a one of the technique to complement um, uh, what they have been doing. But what we do is we are actually doing a psychotherapy master solely based on Buddhist teachings with all the Buddhist assumptions, but we are borrowing techniques from psychology to supplement it. So I don't know if that answers your questions. <laughs> and and um, I would also say that technique is technique. And as, a, as is appropriate based on my clinical judgment for any particular situation for any particular client, I might teach meditation, I might teach mindfulness, I might not, depending on the particular moment and all the situation around it, depending on the phenomena. So that's a final, oh. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the beautiful presentation and the concepts. It was very helpful. Um, I have a question and a comment. The question is regarding the uh, use of mental illness as a um, occurring um, label that we assign to people who are actually going through normal life transitions such as grief or sadness or you know things that are very normal in life but then if we label them with a mental illness they have to go out of society and face a very harsh reality of judgment by their family and friends and they don't know how to treat them. So um, my question is, if, um, with all these beautiful Buddhist concepts that you have also thought about, including the Sangha uh, concept of uh, the support in the family to uh, educate also the circle of the patients who have a more, uh, a better go back to life, normal life. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the first part is about the labeling of mental illness. And in Chitta Psychotherapy, we do not see diagnosis as, as important. For our understanding, diagnosis is important for communication around peer professionals uh, and also for claiming insurance. And also for research. Oh, and also for research, yes, yes, yes. And also, I mean, like that, um, we're not saying that that is not helpful, but what we're saying is it does not capture the essence of individual experiences. Every person has their own karmic body, own five aggregates. When I'm depressed, it's very different from say that like you are depressed or when you are depressed. So that's why when we do treatments, we, we kind of see the symptoms, we know the suffering, but we do not cling onto that concept to label that person or force that person into any kind of label. We see the person as any any other suffering individual, and the goal is still to see reality as it is. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to take a tea break for about half an hour. Please help yourself with some vegetarian refreshment outside the hall. And please come back at 3.45. Thank you. <laughs>